The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Returning from the district of Tyre, Jesus went by the way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee, right through the Decapolis region. And they brought him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech. And they asked him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, put his fingers into the man's ears and touched his tongue with spittle. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and he said to him, At Fata, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and the ligament of his tongue was loosened, and he spoke clearly. When Jesus ordered them to tell no one about it, but the more he insisted, the more widely they published it. Their admiration was unbounded. He has done all things well, they said. He makes the deaf hear and the dumb speak. The Gospel of the Lord. At Fata, be open. That Aramaic word which not few are retained in the gospel narrative. This is one, et fata, be open. I don't want just to stay on this miracle that Jesus worked. He worked many miracles as the gospel gave us. But behind the miracles or beyond the miracles are very important lessons that he wants the hearers of his time, his disciples in particular, but also for us today to pick it up also. So it's quite a load of things to consider actually. Be open. It is not confined in the heart and mind of Jesus and the will of God just to make a person physically well again from one's illness or sickness. As in the case here is definitely impediment in which a person is deprived of speaking properly and of hearing. Modern science today can contribute a lot to this whole being again, to make one well again. And so it's not just about that one, because if Jesus is just confined to that, then this Jesus, God, is a very small God. But God is bigger than that. I'd like to connect what perhaps in the second reading that we have just heard, from St. James in his epistle in general to Christians, especially of his time, which the other epistles give us an insight that many of the Christian communities of the apostolic time were minorities and by and large they were also non-Jews. There were Jews who were converted to follow Jesus, but many did not accept Jesus as the promised Messiah. And so with that, that means the early church had to grow into the Lord and to have a deeper insight into Jesus' person, life, and teachings. It's very important because it is then it has an impact on the believer, each of them, to learn to have, like St. Paul would put it beautifully, the mind and heart of Jesus. A lifelong process for every one of them and for every one of us, including myself. So obviously then in that worship community there, just like in our worship community, they have problems there. And it stood out. And so James have to address that when they come to worship, they were well, somehow there is a segregation of the mind, the division of the mind in which they were thinking, and at the same time, St. James would put it pretty strong, judges, and at that, corrupt judges, which means unjust judges. And that is, they were judging people in the worship community. This person, that person, especially the external things they were judging, how the person is dressed up, whether there's any gold, diamonds around the person, fingers, clothes, hand, whatever it is. 
that distracted them from true worship. That means if we take a father as our point of reference, they were pretty blinded. They didn't see, they didn't have the vision of Jesus yet. Granted, they were early Christian community. They have to know the Lord more and more, and by, at the time there were not many written accounts of Jesus. It took a longer time after the apostles left. The earliest the scholar tells us would be around 50 AD after Jesus went back ascension, 30 years after his departure. First written account about Jesus. So coming back, they have to struggle in their Christian understanding and faith, vision, and expression, not just worship time, but to relate with people in life, with one another especially as church. And so they had to overcome their spiritual, mental, attitudinal blindness. They have to get rid of that. And it's no easy process. I'm sure you can identify with that, right? So what will it take then for, for them and for you and I as we listen to the text to arrive at that awareness of that openness, at that a father that Jesus proclaimed to that person and from that person to all of us, actually? How do we get it done? And obviously, there must be an instruction so in this case, in this case, they brought this man to Jesus for him to heal. That means the community. Community can be an individual within the person or few more. They bring the person to Jesus. That means they make the person, they help the person to come to aware of Jesus. And then from there, the Lord takes it up. So we have to do our part to bring whoever we find needs God's help. And we can do that by praying for the person. Okay, you may not know the person. See, in this case here, somebody may have some problem, epilepsy or whatever it is here. You pray for the person. You may not know the person, at least that part. And it's from there then, when we introduce Jesus to one another, even as baptized Christians, we allow God to work in us. We allow God, the person that we are praying for, to work with the Lord to bring about the changes, the transformation. So when James wrote this to the Christian of his time, that community there, he's actually, another way to put it is, we read into it, that he wants, he's introducing them to the necessity of transformation or change in their vision, in their thinking, in their mentality, in their attitude. And to do that, of course, he said, you've got to center on Jesus. You've got to put Jesus in the middle of it all, and not just a one-day affair, but a lifelong affair, in which then slowly when we get to know Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord opens us up and help us to know Jesus more and more. None of us here can say, I know Jesus. <clears throat> if you do that, be very watchful. You may say, I am am confident in the Lord. I want to know him more. That's pretty safe. And this is so because look at St. Thomas among the apostles, all the others also, but Thomas in that resurrection episode gave us an insight to this. He thought he knew Jesus, the same with all the apostles. But Thomas stood up, even when the others say, we have seen the Lord, we have seen him, he's come. What did he say? Unless I touch the hands the nails made in his hole, the holes in his hands, and the sight, I will not believe. That means he's still apart from me. You see how blind he is, he was? Not open yet. It's only when Jesus came. That means they introduced the risen Lord to Thomas. Thomas said, not yet until I see him. Okay. The next time when Jesus came, then... Jesus had to teach all of them and Thomas. Touch me, my hands and the side. That's where then Thomas got the afarta experience. And that is why he can utter, my Lord and my God. 
This is so important for us to remember and to take note. It has an implication in our personal life in relations with the Lord. There are many areas in your life and mine that needs this opening, this spiritual awareness, alertness, consciousness. Because it has a bearing on the choice we've got to make in life as Christian. Do I really want to follow Jesus and let his truth and his gospel to be part of me, in my person, my behavior, my character? He warned us on this when he warned, uh, when he rebuked and corrected the disciples, including also the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious spiritual leaders of Jesus' time. What did he say? You have eyes, but you see not. You have ears, but you hear not. Is that true, my friend? You and I have eyes to see and ears to hear. But is that statement true from Jesus? We've got to be honest and truthful. Yes, we fail also many times to understand, which means mentally, intellectually, to see what Jesus is saying, what he was teaching. And to hear at the same time, it runs together. Even if any one of us is visually handicapped or can't hear properly also handicap. there's that inner part of our being that can see and that should see and understand and hear. And that is the other level. It's called the spiritual level. Okay? And that's what I believe Jesus is in his story here, this narrative here, as in many others. His miracles he worked doesn't stay there just to struck us and to make us dumbfounded or awed or astonished at it. No, that's, that's not the gospel uh, goal of Jesus. It is from there to help us go further into God. Okay? And so we need to ask then, the Lord the grace to know more, be open to the truth of God. We see this happen, and if you like, Jesus takes it up. Isaiah a thousand or perhaps 700 or 800 years before Jesus' time. Where then the people of God who worship the same eternal God before his incarnation as Jesus Christ, they were in a situation, and we can all be in a situation, where they were in exile. And when you are in exile, you may not have the experience, but we can read and try to understand, they lost everything almost their identity almost lost too in a foreign land for many years okay they were in a state of despair distress downhearted afraid fearful because they were enslaved and as they came at a time where god gave them the message of encouragement and that god will work the miracle to transform them and to bring them back to the state of joy and peace when they're able then to return from the exile back to the promised land. So meanwhile, we hear what Isaiah said again. Say to all faint hearts, courage, do not be afraid. Your God is coming, vengeance is coming. The retribution of God is coming to save you. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unsealed, the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongues of the dumb sing for joy. Beautiful, encouraging words, right? For water gushes in the desert, streams in the wasteland, scorched earth becomes a lake, the parched land springs of water. Very encouraging note for the people in great distress and despair. And so the same for us. As we journey into God, it's not an easy journey for all of us, for Christians all over the world. Especially now with modern media, we have access to very reliable, if not at times scam and fake news, but reliable news of what's happening around the world. It can be very discouraging okay, for the world and for us as church. But it's good to tailor it and to temper it, if you like, with the good news that even in all these unfavorable situation and conditions of life, we still have this living God among us. 
But are we open to this God to help us know how to manage all these problems and challenges and to continue journeying with faith just like the people in exile of Isaiah's time? And just like the people of St. James' time, we too as church must be willing to open our hearts and mind to the love that God has had for other people who may be different from us, disagree with us, or even in conflict with us. Like the beautiful image that I pick it up and send to friends, and you all can get it very easily, the Pope's visit to Indonesia. And you have the grand imam eventually come to the point, the Pope's on the wheelchair, saying their goodbye and so forth, and he just touched the Pope, kissed the Pope on his head, and the Pope kissed his hands. Powerful and beautiful symbol of being open to one another because created by this one God. But how much are we willing to open to each other, to help each other know this God and love this God so that our differences can be then corrected as we know this true and loving God of ours. So at Fata, not confined to just that man with the impediment of speech and hearing, but it's about all of us. Because we may have eyes, but we see not. We may have ears, but we hear not. It's only an insight when we are clearer from our sinfulness, then we can become clearer and more receptive to the voice of God.